distinguished guests, dear friends and audience online. Uh, good afternoon and uh, also good morning. I'm Shirley Ren, director of CCG Publishing Center. Today, it's our great honor to host this CCG Global Dialogue event. And uh, you will notice the theme of this event, the new global universities uh, reinventing education in the 21st century, is also the title of a new book will be uh, published uh, in this December. Mm. We have invited the author of this book um, to CCG today and I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to uh, listen to his sharing in the next one and a half an hour. And we are also uh, looking forward to listen to the dialogue between the two senior educators present at CCG today and uh, their sharing will uh, center around the very challenging issues in current uh, higher education uh, field. So uh, please let me to introduce our two distinguished guests, Professor Nova Picos, the co-author of the new global universities, reinventing education in the 21st century, Mm, Professor Picos is the Dean for Academic Strategy and Learning Innovation and Director of the Institute for Global Higher Education in Duke Quinshan University. He is also an uh, Associate Provost at Duke University with uh, responsibilities in academic strategy, global initiatives, and educational innovation. He has written widely on innovation and uh, globalization in higher education, including co-authored the book, Liberal Arts and Sciences Innovation in China. Uh, today, another distinguished guest is Professor Pan Qingzhong. He is uh, Executive Dean of Schwarzman College at Tsinghua University. Welcome, Professor Pan. Pre Professor Pan previously uh, served as director of the development office at the School of Economics and Management of Tsinghua University. He also used to be a respected researcher at the Tsinghua University's Corporate Governance Research Center. Professor Pan is also an expert on CCG's academic committee. Yeah. Mm. Now, first, uh, allow me to invite uh, Professor Nova Picos to deliver the keynote speech. Yeah, welcome, please. Uh, thank you for that uh, warm welcome. Thank you, Professor Pan, for being here with me. Thank you to uh, Director uh, Wang Huayao uh, for the invitation. It's, uh, it's an honor and a delight to be here, and I look forward to the conversation uh, with Professor Pan and uh, with, with all of you. Um, I want to talk to you today drawing on two sources. Primarily, I'm going to tell you about this new book that my co-author Brian Penpraise and I have written. Uh, professor Penpraise is an astrophysics professor. I am a public policy professor, so we are crossing divides here. But I'm also going to draw on a report that uh, I did with Kara Godwin uh, several years ago on the liberal arts and sciences in, in China. I'll mostly talk about global initiatives, but I want to make a few connections to China, and I look forward to learning from all of you uh, more about that. So if you look around the world today, there are calls everywhere for the reform of higher education and in particular undergraduate education. That uh, you can read report after report about the need for students who are more creative, who are more uh, able to solve complex problems, who can collaborate and work in teams, who can work across disciplines, not just be in one narrow area and who have the ability to engage interculturally with each other, representing both their own culture, but also knowing how to communicate with others. Um, and as it turns out, as you all probably know better than I do, these are the same kinds of things that many government reports uh, have called for from the MOE's 2035 modernization plan, the 20th Party Congress report, um, 
for reforming general education in China, investing in interdisciplinary studies, uh, it, adapting and advancing the best pedagogical best practices, being more interdisciplinary, uh, and um, reaching using technology to leverage the possibilities. You can see this uh, report from McKinsey's Global Institute on the need for reskilling in China, not only in undergraduate education, but across lifelong learning and the habits and the minds and, uh, and the skills that everybody needs. And of course, it wouldn't be a talk on higher education if I didn't have an image of generative AI, um, which doubles down, triples down, underscores the existential importance of developing students who are capable of all of these kinds of ideas that I've articulated here because so much of what a student used to do will be done by AI and these skills and habits are what are absolutely necessary for the student success and if we're going to solve global problems. In the US there's a problem though. The problem is it's very hard to make changes in higher education. This is a new book from the former president of McAllister College in um, uh, liberal arts uh, college in uh, the US and at the Harvard Graduate School now um, and his title is whatever it is I'm against it. That in the US there's so many stakeholders who have so many different ideas about what a college or university should be doing that it's hard to actually do anything bold. The faculty want one thing, the alumni want another thing, donors want a third thing, regulators want a fourth, the students want a fifth. I'm exhausted just listing it. And it goes on and on. And you can see this is just a handful of books. I could give you 30 more calling for the need in American higher education for more robot proof higher education, for new forms of innovation, new kinds of universities, and it's just very hard to actually bring this about. Now there is a WeChat moment here in China, right? As all of you know, Tencent had QQ and it was a perfectly reasonable messaging device and you could have kept improving on that. But that's not what they did. They created WeChat which leapt ahead of all the other kinds of technologies that exist anywhere else in the world that combines, we all have it on our phones, we could, we could link up right now and we could buy our train tickets and share our social media uh, and do all the kinds of things that it takes five different apps to do in the US and that draws on traditions, the red packet tradition uh, in China that has a cultural dimension to it that is not simply global. And what I'm here to talk to you about, mostly not by focusing on China, but I want to note that I think there is a WeChat moment here if Chinese higher education was able to seize the opportunity not simply to imitate and to follow, but to leapfrog, to leap ahead what uh, we're struggling to try and do in the US and elsewhere. So where does this book come in? The book comes from my colleague and uh, my co-author and I's experience. I was helping to build Kunchan Dukkha Dashwe and my colleague was helping to build Yale NUS in Singapore. And we discovered that all these constraints that frustrated this in America for bringing about change were actually, if you looked all over the world, it wasn't just in Quinchan, it wasn't just in Singapore, but in India, in East Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Europe, Latin America, North America, there was something we don't hear much about. There were academic entrepreneurs, not business entrepreneurs, right, although some of them came from business, but we're so used to lionizing, you know, the Bill Gates of the world and the, 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 the innovators. Here, we found that there were people from inside and outside of universities. And they were at these eight universities. There are many more. We just picked these eight. And we were fascinated by them because they started from scratch. Right? And if you ask anybody who works in, an ac in academia, Professor Pan, I think will agree with this, uh, and certainly you had that experience when you were building Schwartzman. It's a rare opportunity to start from scratch and to say, 
what is the highest and best kind of university or college we can build now, not having to pay attention to what everyone already is, has invested in. And so we tell the stories of these academic entrepreneurs, and not just what they did, but how they did it, and the difficulties they encountered, and the ways they had to make their changes in order to succeed. I want to tell you today just about three kinds of changes that they made. I hope this interests you, and you'll want to read the book, and there's more there. One example is a small, tiny college of engineering in Needham, Massachusetts, in the shadow of the great MIT. And it was founded just over 20 years ago. And it was founded with the idea that engineers are too often taught to basically imitate Beethoven, to basically learn the notes over and over again. And as important as that is, there are huge challenges out there in society, social challenges, engineering challenges, grand challenges of sustainability, as an example, that engineers need to not simply be in the back room designing schemes, but need to actually be invested and involved in solving human needs and solving social problems. And so they built, built an education there which um, doesn't have departments, the faculty don't have tenure, everything there has an expiration date. They don't say we have a curriculum and it'll be that curriculum for the next 50 years. They're constantly innovating. They do things like they take a first year student who has had no training in anything beyond high school and they put them in a group and they say you have five weeks to build a pulse oximeter. Go. Go. And it turns out, as none of you will be surprised, the students can do this. They can source the materials, they can get the mentorship, they can figure it out, and they can have that experience instead of what most engineers school do, which is wait till you're in your fourth year to actually touch something and build it. They start building from the beginning. And they start focusing not on simply creating new technologies, but imagining what the solutions are to world problems that engineers can contribute to. It's an adaptable school that focuses on creativity in a place often not considered to be creative engineering. Two examples of another kind of, of set of institutions. Very different schools, but there's a family resemblance I want to focus on. One is the African Leadership University, started in 2014 by Fred Swanaker. Fred left his native Ghana when he was four, fleeing a coup. And he lived in four different countries in Africa because of so much instability and leadership problems and corruption in Africa. And he came to the conclusion, interestingly, he then went to McAllister College the, uh, in Minnesota, of the president I just mentioned, and then he went on to Stanford Business School. And he came up with this idea. He wasn't even focused on education. He was focused on the idea that the problem in Africa is fundamentally a problem of leadership. So he wasn't talking about creativity and adaptability in engineers. He wanted to create 3,000 new leaders who were ethical, who were trained in complex ways, and who could really lead to bring wise judgment and sophisticated understanding. And his initial thought was he was going to build 25 new campuses all over Africa to do this. Well, he built two of them in Mauritius and Rwanda. They're remarkable places. And he started with the high school in South Africa that cost $30,000 American, then $16,000 in Rwanda, then 12,000 in, uh, sorry, in Mauritius, then 12,000 in Rwanda, relentlessly driving the price down. But you can see where this is going. $12,000 is still too expensive in Africa. And so he pivoted from building two campuses to creating a series of regional hubs all across Africa and leveraging online learning so students anywhere could access this. And he told the students that they were not there to, look, to do majors, to major in chemistry or history. They were there to find a mission for their life, 
to define a grand problem. And just like those students in Olin who built the pulse oximeters, they would spend at ALU three or four years sourcing from the best lectures and courses online to the local mentors and learning by doing. It fit the regional context. Meanwhile, another innovator came out of Silicon Valley Ben Nelson in, 1940, in 1914, in 2014, launched Minerva University. Interestingly, he launched it with venture capital, starting with benchmark uh, uh, ventures in the US, funded Uber and other big companies, then supported by two Chinese found, uh, uh, venture funds, the Tall Group and ByteDance. And this was a globally distributed university. There's no campus. There's no swimming pool, there's no library, there's no dorms. The students come from all over the world. They come from families, in most cases, that make less than $50,000 or less than $25,000 around the world. They live in these seven different cities. They go from San Francisco to Taipei to Buenos Aires to Munich to around the world. And they learn online. Now, you might say, oh, these schools are doing a lot of online learning. It's not really high quality. Not true. Both of these institutions, and particularly Minerva, stepped back and said, knowledge is everywhere. We, it's exploding. You have more knowledge in your phone than the greatest libraries of the world have had for centuries. So surely we cannot simply teach our students more and more content. Yes, of course engineers need to know how to stand up buildings and we need to know history and we need to know chemistry. But what both of these entrepreneurs understood and what Ben Nelson in particular did is they identified, remember that first slide, complex problem solving, creative thinking, collaboration. They identified in Minerva's case 80 habits and concepts that regardless of the content, regardless of the content, every student should know, no matter your area, and that you should have to learn these concepts and show how you can deploy them not just in one area, but across areas of knowledge. So take the concept of a feedback loop, right? We know in nature there are feedback loops, that we know ways in which nature can generate positive feedback loops, and the ways in which right now in our environment we're seeing negative feedback loops. Well, that's the same concept that happens in society. And they're training students who can learn about this in a sustainability class and apply it to solve the problem of homeless people, and vice versa. And so they're focused on durable skills rather than just on content. And they've both driven down cost. Third example, NYU Abu Dhabi, Yale and US College. You can also think of NYU Shanghai here. You can think of Duke Kunchan University here. These are small institutions that have brought students from all around the world, truly global, a global students, 60 countries, 80 countries represented in one university and faculty with the idea that really what they need to do is build a core set of knowledge that is global, that is not just one country's history, but drawing on be the best traditions from different countries and putting them into conversation with each other. And intensively, we all know there's some students here, you all know how hard it is to actually get to know people who are different than who you are. It's fine when faculty say, go get to know each other, but it's challenging. So they have designed, just as Schwarzman has designed, ways in which students ha engage each other in active ways and they have built these problem-solving interdisciplinary majors so that you are creating the most fundamental thing that education can do. Right? Education is in the long run. Education looks not to what happens in five years, but 10, 25, 50, and 100. And these universities are bringing together and educating national leaders who will be able to represent their nation know their history and traditions, 
but also become global leaders able to talk with other global leaders and literally able to speak English speakers who can speak Chinese, native Chinese who know not only English but other languages, ways in which our problems aren't going to go away. In some ways, they're getting worse. So this doesn't promise an answer. It just promises the ability of students who, when they become leaders, they've met when they're 18. And they know something about each other, as well as knowing something about themselves. So those are three different kinds of incredibly exciting universities that we tell the story of. And let me just close by telling, giving you a few takeaways from all of these stories. The first is, here are some of the key elements that we've seen in some of these universities. You've heard me talk about them. And again, go back to that first slide where you saw generative AI and the McKinsey Global Report about the skills and habits that, excuse me, everybody needs to flourish nowadays. So some have built these incredibly exciting global core curriculums. Many have built majors that don't just say you study computer science or you study economics. No, they do computer science and entrepreneurial leadership. They find ways of breaking things down. They, they, they have you study the brain and social behavior. They put them together. Skills-based education, this most fundamental thing beneath the content. Experiential education, actually getting out there and having that affective social experience that drives home the learning in a way that, let's be honest, I'm a professor. I understand the limits of the classroom. Sometimes you need to experience it, not just be in the classroom. But when you're in the classroom, you need to be there in active ways. You need to be there. The lecture, it is beyond doubt the science of learning has demonstrated, there's no question, that the single worst method for students to learn is for a professor to lecture. And I will not embarrass anyone by asking how many times you sit through professors lecturing. I'm about to run out of time because 20 minutes is about the limit that anyone should talk before you get actively involved. And last, flexible systems, building institutional structures so you can actually, what do companies do? They don't every 30 years redo their curriculum. They have ways in which it's a constant, continuous process of improvement. And that should be how universities operate. And at Kuncha and Duka Dashwe, we are trying to do all of these things. Right? This is challenging. It's a lot of change at a lot of time. But the faculty and the students and the staff are all in on this. And for them, it's the most exciting pioneering experience. And I, I invite you to visit, and I invite you to join one of these universities. One more slide on takeaways. These are small institutions I'm looking at. Right. We're not looking at the PKUs and the Tsinghuas and the Fudans. And we do that intentionally, partly because we want to tell the story of the founding garage, the technology invented at the beginning, not when the company is already 20 years old. And partly because, actually, these schools can do things that traditional universities struggle with. And let me mention these three. First, it's incredible the rankings that these schools, right? I got my PhD from Princeton University, which has got to be 300 plus years old. It's hard to compete with 300 years of prestige when you're starting a new university. MIT, MIT named Olin College of Engineering amongst the top universities in the world for engineering education. Minerva University is ranked as the number one most innovative university in the world. Fast Company Magazine ranked African Leadership University as the number one most innovative company in all of Africa. Look at what NYU Abu Dhabi has produced in terms of student outputs. I don't want to dwell on rankings, but I don't want to ignore them. In 20 years, that's impressive. And it's gone beyond rankings. It's actually gone to a demonstration effect. 
So in countries like Vietnam, where Fulbright University is, or India, Ashoka University, they have opened a floodgate of government openness and of other uh, institutions and other entrepreneurs trying to rush in and fill that. And sure, some of them are going to be fly by night, some of them aren't going to be good, you, but we're going to experiment. The demonstration effect of small institutions leads to more pluralism, more experimentation, not just giant universities. Second, many of these universities are driving down cost while driving up quality, right? You saw that with ALU and Minerva, but even schools like Ashoka and, F and Fulbright University Vietnam, while they are still expensive in the context of Vietnam or India, they are one-tenth the cost of going to the US or to the UK for that same education. So you can learn in your country, be connected to your country, and yet get the finest kind of education. And last, I've already spoken to the power of training future national and global leaders together. Um, I'll close with just these two things. This book is part of a larger project. In this June, we are going to gather not eight universities, but 25 universities, including some from China, who have started in the last 25 years. And we're going to ask them, what are your lessons? And what can we learn from you? And how do we start a movement doing this? Then we're going to come and we will hold at DKU, we hope in a partnership with the Center for China Globalization and China, uh, a China-focused conference on these. Um, and if you're interested in any of this, uh, if you scan the QR code, you can get a link. Uh, uh, you can get a link to the book, which will be uh, available uh, here in China in January. And if you'd like uh, the Chinese or English language version of our report on innovation in education in China, we are also happy to share that with you as well. I've gone over my time. You've been very patient. Thank you, uh, and I look forward to our conversation. Uh, thank you, Professor Pickers. Uh, thank you for your wonderful speech. I believe your speech will stimulate uh, more thinking both on today and in the coming years. And uh, actually, uh, the higher education is also a very important topic in CCG. We have published uh, the annual report on Chinese students studying abroad for eight consecutive years and aiming to provide more information to the public. And uh, for the next uh, session of today's CCG Global Dialogue event, let, uh, let me uh, in, yeah, invite Professor Pan yeah, to have a conversation uh, with uh, Professor Picos. And uh, the time is for you too. And we hope to um, hear more wonderful yeah, ideas, wonderful sharing. Thank you. Yeah, it's on. Very good. So we can start our conversation and also the questions. And good afternoon, good afternoon, and good morning. And uh, that's uh, three, before we start, the three minor uh, the points. The first, there's a great, great the book talking about the next 77 years was uh, the higher education going. And uh, the Shwasan College will buy the book. And that is number one point. And, that, uh, and also Tsinghua. So I'm not sure, but the Tsinghua Library Director was a former Schwarzman College Dean, so Professor Wang. So I'll convince him to buy. So there's a number one. So <laughs> thank you. And uh, the number two, you're talking about the three changes. That is uh, very important. And also use the five examples. And uh, if I were younger 10 years, I would jump in either universities. You know, this is very attractive, and there's an all in college of uh, the engineer, right? So there's a very kind of the very free, right? So they can do everything, and they, they don't need to get a very high pressure for their tenure track, professor, anything. But the student really get the benefit, right? So it's like uh, uh, the Minova and the travel around, 
and online and offline. So experiential, experiential learning, right? So they're so so great. And uh, number three, you know, Schwarzman College, you know, all of the, the university mentioned in your book, including that's of five you mentioned, all of these universities, the Schwarzman College, we have their students. Like Minova, this co cohort, we have one, last cohort, one, and the African Leadership University, we have one, and all of them, I can tell you, they're very successful, high talent, is so great. That means they're successful. That means that that's a change you mentioned. It's very successful. And uh, the Strasbourg College, our students can give you the, the, a proof. A proof. That's a great, great change. So thank you so much. Very good. So, and uh, please give uh, Professor Pickers another a round of applause. <laughs> thank you. The question, you know, there are, uh, uh, the audience may know the questions. We have a, they have a lot of questions. The first question is it's just about to ask, so what's the challenge? And uh, I, I know a lot of challenges. What's the number one challenge? The, the number one challenge for, well, the, I'm going to mention two. Okay. okay. So because there's one <laughs> to get one, started. one free. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. There's one to get started, and then there's one to succeed. The number one challenge to get started is that higher education is different from other economic markets. In other markets, if you have a better product at a cheaper price, you succeed. That's not the case in higher education. And the reason that's not the case in higher education is because nobody quite knows what the product is. Nobody quite knows what is it, particularly in education. Research, a little clearer. But in education, it's hard to know what the product is. Um, how do you know one student is better trained than another student, right? It's a long-term It's a long-term, right. <laughs> and so people use proxies. And the proxy that is used in higher education is prestige, right? Oh, this school has a high ranking. It must be good. Well, what determines the rankings? Well, what other people think about it. So it's all about reputation and prestige. And when you start out, it's very hard when you don't have a brand and you don't have prestige. So the first thing these schools had to do was how to overcome that. And then the second challenge they face is they have these big audacious visions. Mm. They, that's how they attract people. That's how they, they drive the energy. But they, sometimes they have to change course. And, um, and sometimes people who are good at coming up with great visions are not good at being flexible. And so the schools that have succeeded the best have been able to keep enough of the original vision, mm -hmm. right? But also stay flexible. At African Leadership University, when Fred Swanaker decided that they were not going to build another 23 campuses, well, a lot of people They'd signed up for that. They wanted to build the Harvard of Africa. And Fred had to say, we're not here to build campuses. We're here to train leaders. We need to do it in a more cost-effective way, and we're going to pivot. That led to a lot of people leaving the organization. So audacity and flexibility is the, is the, is the hardest trick for these entrepreneurs to balance. Mm, that's great. Yeah, so we have to stay our mission and vision, but also keep that flexible, right? So because the world changes, everything changes, yeah. So, and also for the education is definitely different from the economic development, right? It's a short term, long term, you can put them together, but education is only long term, long run. So you have to, you know, the 10 years, as you mentioned in your speech, it's 10 years at least, and then we can see the change is okay or not. I only can give you an example of Schwarzman College and the evaluate your students is very good, right? But uh, it's still short term. Right? Yeah, so the leaders will see the leaders in the future, right? Yeah, okay, thank you so much. And uh, also, you know, there's another question, you know, you mentioned there's a low cost and the high quality. So that's true. And, uh, but how can keep that uh, sustainability, sustainability for this, uh, the, the universities? This, I know there's a very, it's a good try and the change. And uh, today we can see there's a good trend. But how to make that sustainability? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge question um, because the, in, in some ways, the drive for lower cost 
has led to higher quality. Why? So I'll come to the problem in a moment, but it helps to step back. You, you might think lower cost, why would that lead to higher quality? Well, the reason it does is because it leads these academic entrepreneurs to have to think differently about things, right? So for instance, Olin decided they weren't going to have tenured faculty. They weren't, right? Now, that means that, that they have more flexibility. They can count on the faculty to be more flexible and adaptive, and that there were enough faculty of high quality who were attracted to that, who wanted to do research, but didn't want to be pulled between their research and their teaching constantly. And so the lower cost at places like Minerva and ALU um, uh, led to coming up with much more inventive ways. At Minerva, you know, if you look at most universities, there's a, a big catalog, right? There's thousands of courses. And it, it just sprawls. There's no control over it. You get approved by the course committee and you're in. Um, and what Minerva figured out was no, we need to have courses that connect to each other. So just because a faculty member wants to teach something, sure, sometimes we can do that. But in general, we need a smaller number of courses so that they can all be tightly connected to each other. The students still have choice, but the result is that the students get a more coherent education and the university doesn't have to staff a million different courses, right? So the, the parameter, you know, in engineering, when you have parameters of design, it helps you to shape in creative ways. And the low cost really helped here. Now the challenge comes that, uh, for instance, using Minerva again as an example, the challenge comes with um, when you're also trying to make sure anybody can have access to this. Mm -hmm. And Minerva, by offering this education originally at $10,000, now $30,000, drew the most incredible students from around the world. But it turns out those are needy students, and Minerva doesn't have an endowment built up over centuries. And so the sustainability problem becomes it's hard to scale a single uh, institution. And I think what these, and so I, I think what we're seeing is a kind of pluralism, which is to say you get cost savings if you go to scale, but you can also simply have more experiments in more places around the world that can sustain themselves without always having to get big. So getting big is not bad, mm -hmm. but it can compromise quality and a thousand pluralistic Minervas and Ashokas can, I think, be the equivalent of 10 giant institutions. So the quality is soon the number one consideration, right? And so for the, for the traditional universities, that, that kind of education, uh, you know, there's a teaching, there's a research, and also think tank, like a policy provider. But for this kind of the uh, universities, I mean, the, the change of the universities, the new era universities, how to balance these three things? Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it's a very fair question. So most universities have to do, the, there's the triangle, right? You've got research, you've got teaching, and you've got various forms of social engagement, um, whether it's technology transfer or public policy right. engagement or finding ways to serve uh, society's needs. Exactly. Yeah. And those issues have gotten only more demanding because the demands for research have gone up, right? The cost of research. The demands for better teaching have gone up. The demands, many in many countries, universities get turned to to solve all kinds of problems. We have childcare problems in the city. Can the university help, right? Yeah. These kinds of issues are very difficult. Um, and I think that if you look at that triangle, you can look at any university, and it's very, very hard to maximize all three of those. In fact, at some places, it's hard to maximize two. And to some degree, I think that's okay. Not every university has to be 
simply a cop carbon copy of every other university. You can have, Arizona State University has done great work in improving their uh, research in significant ways and in um, uh, creating access for many more students at a low cost. They've also improved their quality. Now, I don't know that their quality is the same as Minerva's quality, but they're working on all three. And I think the challenge is when it comes to education, even the established universities um, can think creatively about even when we have faculty that are very research focused, we still have an obligation to not put those faculty in the classroom who are just going to lecture. That's just, that should be malpractice and it shouldn't be allowed. And it's, uh, it's, it, they may not be the best teachers in the world, but they should not be the worst. And at the same time, you can incentivize and build uh, cores of faculty, whether they have tenure or not, who are really leading and most engaged in students. So I think existing universities can get this balance. It's not going to be perfect at any one place. And many of the schools we ended up focusing on, Yale NUS and NYU Abu Dhabi, really balance in Ashoka re high quality research and teaching. Um, the other schools made a decision that if you really want the highest quality of education, then you need to make sure people are not fundamentally focused on their research. So great. OK, very good. And also in your speech, you uh, mentioned that's uh, adaptability, right? So that's uh, today is a lot of challenges. Like you mentioned, this is technology and uh, the AI and the big data. So that will absolutely will impact the future's education. So there's online adapted already for the change, right? But so this is rapidly change. So how do you think that's changed the so, impact? So I think there are two things going on there. One is, um, one is, in, is structural mm -hmm. and structural. one is, is educational. The structural part, let's talk about established universities, mm -hmm. not new ones. Mm -hmm. So established universities can't do what a new university does, right? They mm -hmm. already have departments and faculty and research and commitments. They're not, and they're doing great things, lot of, right? A lot of negative as that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they're, 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 you know, PKU, Tsinghua, Fudan, uh, uh, doing remarkable things. But um, our universities are themselves complete ecosystems of innovation. Mm -hmm. I think what, um, established universities can do is try to give permission for some parts of the university to experiment, to iterate, to prototype. One thing I love about Olin is, and anyone who works in a university knows you have a new idea and you have to get it all approved before you've ever tried it. And at Olin, you come up with a new idea and you get two years to pilot it. Because who knows if it's going to work? And after two years, you come back to get approval. Right? And if you can give permission to faculty who want to iterate and prototype and experiment, you can create incubators on the campus to do that. And that has a demonstration effect, because suddenly the students start coming to all those places. And the other colleges start to notice that. So that's the structural part. I think the educational part is between AI and online technology, we have either a recipe for disaster or the kind of constraints that are going to actually power new educational innovation. So what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. We know that AI is going to require students to learn much more authentic individual skills than they've ever needed before because AI will be able to do so much for them. So all those skills we talked about earlier are really underscored uh, even more. Okay, but let's say you want to deliver this online. Well, the advantage of online is you can reach more people. 
it's more mobile, right? You can take, you could be, you could be doing an internship at CCG and taking a class in the afternoon uh, and not have to, and say you're from Fudan and not have to fly back to Shanghai, right? There's a, lots of ways for a more mobile, flexible education. The problem is most of our educational practices are so bad that when we put them online during the pandemic, Everybody saw it. Mm. They saw that courses didn't connect, that professors were boring, that there was no active learning, that students turned off their videos, right? It showed the emperor had no clothes. Our education systems were rotten. The foundation has rotted. So now that that's been exposed, the opportunity to do online is that you can bring much more intentionality okay, not professor, go into the classroom, close the door and we'll never see. Let's give you some help to how to design an active, intensive, engaging, skills-based course that is not just your lecture notes from 50 years ago. And that way, online can power better education to keep up with AI. So still can, can be engaged, right? Okay, very good. Uh, and. Uh, you know, there's a, in Tsinghua, there's a former, former, former the president called the, uh, President Mei Yiqi, and he has a very famous uh, the saying, and his uh, university is not only about the building, it's about uh, masters. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, there's, we have the ch we, we, we'll have a change. So how to find the, the masters? You mentioned the teaching is so important, and the, the masters, and the leading the professors. That's so important, but competitive, com competitive the, the market over the world, how to find? Well, uh, let me see if I understand the, the question. To find, you know, I, I, I was at uh, SUSTAC in Shenzhen last week, mm -hmm. and I was a, a new university in China, 11 years old. Yes, yes. And I was struck by two things. One was how many of some of the best practices I talked about they had tried to build in from the beginning. Mm -hmm. That they, as a new university in China, were really understanding experiential education, skills-based ed education, interdisciplinary education. Um, there's a school of design there that really uh, uh, is doing enormously. I took a tour of the labs and the creative. It felt like being at Olin College uh, 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 doing engineering and design. Um, so I think there's, um, that was fascinating. The other thing that was fascinating was the global strategy they used to recruit international faculty uh -huh. to come. Mm -hmm. So, the, right, they are positioned, they're new. They can't compete with Tsinghua at oh. the beginning. Mm -hmm. But they can get international professors, Chinese, non-Chinese, uh -huh. worldwide. worldwide. There's a worldwide race for talent here. Uh -huh. And they made opportunities for those faculty, and it lifted them up. And my belief is that universities are like cities. Mm -hmm. You know when you go to a place, if you go to a city and there's coffee shops on the streets and there's people buzzing around and there's energy and there's excitement, you feel creative, right? And if you go to a city and nobody's there or everybody's indoors or there's, right, then you, you don't get any energy back. And it's the same thing with universities, that some of the best researchers in the world want to be surrounded by other creative people, right? They want to be, they want to be surrounded by a poet who's doing creative things, even though it's completely different from their work in engineering, because it's inspiring and it's engaging and it means that there's a whole cauldron and a culture there. And that can embrace, thank you, that can, that can attract, I think, um, we think that you need to attract faculty, you need to just give them a lot of money, and that's true, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, you need to provide them labs, but ultimately you give them that and then they'll go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So how do you create a university that's like a city that you never wanna leave? Mm. It's the uh, ecosystem. It's, it's yeah. the ecosystem. It's the ecosystem. <laughs> and, and if I can say, you know, China has opportunities here that one of the great things about the US system is it's very decentralized. Mm -hmm. So you can get some experimentation. 
But one of the terrible things about the US system is when you actually get a good idea, nobody else adopts it, mm -hmm. right? And China has, what is it, 600 new universities that have started in the last, is it in the last 20 years? In the last 20 years, 600 new universities in China. We've started a research project at the Institute for Global Higher Education at DKU to try to understand which ones of those are doing innovative kinds of things here, which are imitating Western or other universities, mm -hmm. and which are being more like WeChat and trying to leap ahead. And is it all 600? Is it only six? We, we don't know, and we, if you're, this is an area of your knowledge, we'd love to talk with you. But that's where the opportunities to make systematic change are so much more possible here uh, than it is in many other countries. When you, if, if the change is real, I, I remember being in, in Shanghai at a conference put on by the Chaoxing Group uh, with universities from all over uh, China, and I was stunned. Every university stood up and said, well, we do, we're doing Tong Shui Jiayu. We now do, do general education. We're doing interdisciplinary. We're doing experiential. So everyone had got the message. What is not clear to me is how much it actually changed and where the universities are that are really excelling in that and where are there ones where it's Tong Shui Jiao Yu means that you're studying economics and you have to listen to a philosophy professor lecture to you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, very good. So probably the la last one and then we can take the questions from the audience. And uh, so you have taught a lot, a lot of students in the US, China, and across the whole world. And uh, could you tell us, so what kind of the students you love most? <laughs> I love all my students. Okay. <laughs> um, one of my students is, is here right now, Linda Zhang, is from Tianjin. She uh, came to Duke University. This is, uh, she graduated two years ago, three. Uh, she went on to work for McKinsey. Mm. Uh, she is now the chief of staff to a new university, the Nigerian University of Technology and oh. Management. It's mm. a startup, and then she's on her way to Stanford Business School. Oh. Uh, and mm. our plan is to keep building these universities. And this relationship that we've had for now almost seven years was really driven by one thing. Mm -hmm. Agency. Okay. Agency. 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 That, okay. that what, well, I'm going to embarrass Linda here, uh -huh. um, um, but she is passionate about change and she is motivated to want to learn outside. I've, I've never had her in my classroom. Mm. We just worked on a series of projects that are outside the classroom and have, and have led to reports, have led to publications, have led to new projects, have led to the presentation you saw today. Mm -hmm. uh, she was uh, the research assistant on this book. And what I saw at African Leadership University, for example, is their, they have their hashtag, their, their, their motto is do hard things. Wow. And they're, they're they, they're, they're trying to instill in their students, and I saw it in listening to these interviews with students, how the, a student can come in and not think they can compete, mm -hmm. not think that they're there in Nigeria or Rwanda or anywhere uh, in many parts of the world. How do I compete in this global world? Silicon Valley seems like it's a long way away, right? And do hard things. Pick a mission. Mm -hmm. Don't just pick a major. Really instills a sense of agency and you see the students start to believe in themselves. And if they believe in themselves, and then we can give, and again, we didn't have a single class together. And yet, mm -hmm. Linda's agency, her drive, my desire to engage, to mentor, to learn from her, has led to a seven-year collaboration. And that's the most exciting thing that any professor can have. Wow, that's great. Congratulations. Let's uh, do hard, hard things and uh, pick out the mission and get the solutions. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, OK.
Thank you, Professor Picas, and thank you, Professor Pan. Um, I think it's very interesting and uh, deep thinking conversation just now. And I think both professors are ready, and now we have entered our Q&A session. You can raise the question, you can raise question to both professors. And uh, who hope to ask the first question? I think today is a great opportunity, and uh, I hope you raise your hand high. You have a reward. First the question. <laughs> yeah. Give the mobile phone to that girl. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Picas and Professor Penn. Um, my question is for Professor Picas. In your speech, you emphasized the importance of guiding students to be involved in solving real life problems. Earlier this year, I've read a UNESCO report named uh, Reimagine Our Futures Together, a new social contract for education. It also highlights the needs for education to be relevant to the work, world of work and to contribute to long-term social and economic well-being. In this context, how do you envision the role of universities in bridging the gap between academic learning and real-world applications, particularly in pre preparing students not just for uh, current job markets but for the evolving demands of the future workplace and social society challenges. Thank you. Thank you. What a what a wonderful question. Um, and if I, I if I'm not mistaken, I think that UNESCO report was written or at least co-authored by a remarkable man, Fernando Valenzuela, who runs the Global Intac Impact Alliance, and um, uh, he has written reports for UNESCO and I, maybe this one, um, where he has involved in, he's one of these academic entrepreneurs who I last saw, last time I saw him we were in Stockholm and he had just come from Finland. Mm. And all these different kinds of universities uh, in Latin America that he's working with and across the world that are doing exactly what you're saying, trying to find adaptive structures that are different. They're different for each institution. but. At the heart of what they're doing is they're leveraging technology and they're blending the problem solving. Excuse me. They're blending the giving students uh, the experience of solving problems early in their experience um, so that they don't wait for four years to learn how to do this. African Leadership University likes the notion of learn by doing, right? the experiential education where you, <laughs> thank you, Professor Pan. It's the, it's the, there's a bad way to do this and a good way to do this, right? The good way is when you get thrown into a problem and you, you, you literally don't know how to swim. You have to build a pulse oximeter, right? You have to propose a solution to climate change and you don't know anything, and you're thrown back on yourself. And that helps you develop agency, but it also helps you develop the recognition of why knowledge is so important. Instead of going to class and wondering, why is the teacher telling me this? Oh, I guess it's on the exam. Now you're hungry for that information. Now you want to solve a problem, right? Because you see it. And at the same time, when you're in class, you can ask the professor and you can experience what it's like to say, but let's talk about what happens with that theory when it's been implemented in practice. And that, that's a, an ecology, to use Professor Pond's uh, uh, term, where there's a feedback loop that's constantly going throughout your, your, your education, and not just during your undergraduate, but lifelong. The bad way is when students get focused on, oh, I'm going to solve a problem and I don't need to know anything about history. Right? We have a problem, uh, you know, pick a social problem in, in, in China or anywhere in the world. And uh, students who are not informed by history, who haven't read political theory, who don't understand psychology, they can just make the problem worse. They come up with faddish ideas. They just pick up on, oh, the sustainable development goals of the UN. Those must all be great. Well, maybe, maybe not. 
Some of those goals have a lot of implications for other things that we care about, and they're trade-offs. Students have to learn to make trade-offs. So the downside to grand challenges and experiential education is if students think that problems are simple. The upside is if it drives students to realize they're not simple, and I really need to, to learn not only specific skills, but I need to actually encounter different points of view. If you want to, when they say end poverty in the sustainability goals, I, I'm not sure that's a great goal to set. Because I don't think we're going to end poverty. In, we haven't ended it in human history. And when you set it as a goal like that, then any time you fall short, suddenly you're to blame. Instead of what are the best and highest ways we can attend to solving poverty that also fits with the other obligations and commitments we have in our countries. That's what I want students to learn. And so there's a good way and there's a bad way of doing it. And the good way is incredibly exciting. Wayne? Yeah. Oui? Uh, uh, great presentation, Professor. Uh, it still boils down to me, though, to, to, the, to, the, to the quality problem. So the way we deal with quality in the marketplace is we just look at sales. Uh, and I don't know how you address this quality in the marketplace without accreditation, uh, because anybody can set up a school, and then, you know, how do you determine the quality of it? So, so I, I'm curious about how, how would we address this, and how, how, how could we... So if, I, if my assistant is coming from this Nigerian school that your, your friend is, is a part of, how would I know if I'm getting a quality person? Uh, what a... Yes, what a, a great question. I don't have a, I'm gonna be candid, I don't have a full answer to it. Partly because I've been spending my time on universities that are trying to often get around accreditation because the accreditation, so let me speak to that and then try and address your question as best I can. Accreditation in many ways right now is holding back quality because accreditation is asking how do you and your new university look like the university next door, and which we accredited, which could be not good at all, but it filled in all the boxes, right? And so one of the things that, um, like African Leadership University used a Trojan horse approach to do this. They told the accreditors, look, this major in global challenges and entrepreneurial leadership it looks just like your other majors. It really fits, it's all okay. And then they went ahead and developed these radical missions, not majors. So Minerva had to be incubated for 10 years under an accredited university. It took 10 years for them, they were so radical, to get accreditation. So at least in the US, accreditation in many ways is a barrier to quality. But you are 100% right that that doesn't mean accreditation is bad. We see, certainly, uh, I see this across India, where there's just an onrush of institutions rushing in, an onrush, <laughs> a, a large number of institutions rushing in, and people can't tell the difference, right? They don't know, uh, uh, oh, well that looked, they used all the same words, right? They said interdisciplinary, skills-based, experiential. Um, and I, I, I can only think two things there. One is um, that accreditation, we need, we need dynamism in accreditation so it has more credibility itself so that accreditors become part of this um, uh, ecosystem where we've got new quality coming forward and they start applying the lessons from these new universities back to the old ones. The other is we need to think, and we have to be very cautious here, about outcomes, right? We need to think not simply about where did you go to school and what is the name on the degree, but we need to actually be looking at uh, the outcomes. Now some outcomes are long term, so it's hard to get at, right? 
But some outcomes, if you look at many of the universities featured here, it's incredible the ways in which the students are not just winning, uh, uh, going to Schwarzman College or winning Rhodes Scholars, sure, that happens. But many of them are starting companies, many of them are getting into graduate schools, and so you have those kinds of outcomes. And then the, the third kind of outcome, of course, is in the marketplace directly. Um, and you need to look at a place like uh, ALU or uh, Ashoka or Fulbright Vietnam, and those institutions have to demonstrate that they are getting a track record of with employers, and they are. Um, and, and that all then has to be turned back so that those institutions are held up as the prestigious ones and, 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 and that, because again, the market of higher education is driven by prestige and in some ways that's a barrier to entry, but if we really get quality there, then we can say, oh, Fulbright and Ashoka are quality institutions, but these other ones Nobody talks about them in the same way, and we have to actually be very elitist about this and draw a distinction. But I don't, that's a, uh, those are my initial thoughts. It's a big problem. But I mean, listening to you, I, I was struck by, you know, listening to your, just, just listening to, to, to your points about all these creative institutions, I was just struck between this idea of the prestige of Harvard, Yale, Princeton, where these people didn't even try they're not even interested in accreditation because their accreditation is the prestige that you, that, that you, you went here. And, and we've got presidents who went to our school. But then the ones who don't have that prestige, they have to go to uh, accreditation. And then, the, so, so but, but between prestige, accreditation, and outcome is where we need majority. And I don't know, I, I don't know how, how we deal with that. I, I love how you drew the triangle, though. Prestige, <laughs> uh, accreditation, and outcome. And I think that's exactly right. And the prestige, and we have accreditation, but the prestige one should be highlighted for these schools because they have actually earned it in 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then the outcome one is where the real focus needs to be because even Princeton, Duke, all of these places skate by on the fact that they get great students coming in, right? So let's also talk about the value added and the outcomes that that we, and how do we get better at assessing those outcomes? And companies are starting to do that, right? It's companies are starting to look at we don't are, uh, whether or not you have the degree, do you have the skills? And that, I think, is great unless they only prioritize technical and narrow skills. If they prioritize the holistic integrated skills that these universities do, then companies will be doing us a favor. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, another question we we'll hope to ask. Uh, thank you, professors. And uh, I have a question for uh, Professor Pan. So, uh, Professor Pan, uh, from your perspective, having worked in both the uh, IT industry and academia, how can global universities leverage technology, not just as a tool for education, but as a means to bridge cultural divides and foster global collaboration. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very good, good, very good question. And as a Professor Picas uh, mentioned in his speech, and so that's uh, the technology rapidly change. Even in this year, right, this is a chat GPT and the change and the give us a lot, a lot of thinking and the challenge and the inter integrity issues, right? This is use the chat GPT, write the paper, so some scholars did that already. So that uh, is uh, pros and cons. Technology really can bring a lot, lot of a benefit for the education. So you, all the students, including professors, including the adults and the, the professionals, they can learn much more faster than ever before through the technology. So the education is not only the four years or three years in the university and uh, or the eight years, it, it's a lifetime, lifetime learning, lifetime learning, right? So it's a, it's a, and the technology can help us, help everyone to get a lifetime learning. But the, the cons is, the problem is, you know, lots of, lot of uh, knowledge, you have to make a judgment. I mean, 
a lot, a lot of informations and the biased informations, the fake news, you have to make that, make judgment as to who will, you will take, who you cannot take, who you can apply, who you wrong apply, right? So that is, you have to make a judgment, how to, you can get that judgment, the skills you have to learn in the university. So basically, fundamentally, you have to learn, learn in the traditional and the creative ones by the help of the tools, technologies. Technology is really the benefit for our lifetime learning. And another one is also the answer to the first uh, the question, or the, also the great question, that give uh, another additional uh, information. So you know, like Schwarzman College, we do this way, and uh, we have a classroom learning. In the classroom, professors, different professors. Even we make some uh, the reforms of different pro professors teaching the one class and uh, from a different perspective. And uh, another one, another one, second one is uh, uh, experimental learning. And uh, we have the, we call the practice learning, we call the deep dive. We go anywhere in the cities, in the rural areas, in the government, the, the, the companies, state-owned companies even, and all the companies. And they have, uh, that's a required credits. They learn from a society, right? So the first question is how to uh, get the gap smaller. So the, the learn from the classroom and from the school and the, from uh, the society, right? So m get that's the gap smaller. So that's the goes to the practice of learning. And the third, third is a uh, mentorship. You know, you are the future leaders, but so how you you get the future leaders? We use the current leaders to mentor you to for your life, for your study, for everything with the help of uh, all the technology issues we can use online. So you're in the New York, I'm in the Beijing, in the Shanghai. So they can tutoring, coaching our students through all the technologies. And technology really change our life, but so we can get that's a gap, all the gaps, not only the, the school and the, the society gap, all the gaps getting smaller and faster, and faster. So that's a, a very big question, but uh, that's a trend. So that you, Currently, university try to adopt all the technology for our the current education. Use the technology like OA system, like the online system, like we have a, uh, we have the RIN, the Qinghua, the RIN, the, the, the classroom, a lot of uh, online, uh, online the platform education. Thank you so much. Thank you, very good answer. And uh, any other question? Yeah, please raise your hand high, yeah. Thank you, Professor Pikas and Professor Pan. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I have a question for Professor Pan. That considering your invo involvement with the Belt and Road Initiative, what role do you see for global universities in promoting sustainable economy and cultural exchange along this new Silk Road routes? Okay, that's a very, very good question and a big question. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, you know, we just got uh, the Belt and Road in Initiative uh, 10 years already. And uh, so next 10 years, and we have a uh, high quality development uh, Belt and Road in Initiative. High quality means what? A lot of uh, projects need to be high standard, low risk, and uh, a lot, a lot of, uh, uh, high end the project implement. But the key issue, the key issue is the high quality talent. If you don't high quality talent, talent students, how to implement this all the projects. So that's education's number one important. So there's for the next 10 years or even longer time. So how to do that? So we need our education be Upgrade, right? So the, for the next uh, next stage, uh, you mentioned the globalized the education, how to uh, fit suitable and uh, meet that requirements. So give you example, you know in Tsinghua we have uh, before we have around the four thousand international students, and the BNU Be Beijing Normal University they have around four thousand, and. Uh, the Beijing language uh, university, the Beiyu, they have a 4,000, even more, it's, uh, it's 8,000. But now it's getting smaller, 
and uh, get smaller because after COVID is a recovery. But eventually, we need more and more. So the Chinese students going abroad and uh, other uh, countries' students coming to China. So they still learn each other. And uh, under this uh, the education system, new education system, they got the high quality educated. And then they can implement all the high quality uh, the projects, make the high quality development for the next stage. So we need more, more and more students make, uh, I mean, they learn each other and uh, high masters, like uh, Professor Hikas, and uh, the, the goes to the, around the whole world to promote these ideas. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Mm. If I can just add, add one thing to that, I, I, and connect to the earlier question. Um, you know, if you think about sustainable development, there's um, technological aspects to that, but there are also social aspects to that. And understanding that complex interplay within one country, let alone between countries, where there are going to be differences and there are going to be disagreements, and there's a lot of complications there that the, the, the talent, I agree, is the absolutely essential dimension of that. And you, you know, in the book, you can see the, the we've got the globe where each of the universities mm, is located yeah. on the globe. But yeah. now think about the Belt and Road Initiative and think about universities along there producing those kinds of students who simultaneously understand the local conditions, right, the right. regional needs, right. um, and are connected to each other along a larger uh, initiative, road, or uh, uh, globe. Um, and it's that interplay between students who are simultaneously rooted, right, yogenda, and global, right, that that, that that combination is what will make sure that this is an interplay between the social and the technological and not merely a technological thing, which is usually going to end up upended by the social unless you have that interplay. Yeah, that's a question. Very good. Yeah. Okay, Asia. Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you professors. Uh, question for Professor uh, Picus. Uh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the future of U.S.-China educational collaboration. Uh, what do you think should be the key focus areas to enhance and deepen higher education, uh, uh, education ties between these two nations, especially considering the, con the current global context? Well, I am not an expert on U.S.-China relations, so I, I, I want to add that disclaimer. But I do think there are some clear areas um, that, uh, that have emerged. I know that between uh, Duke and uh, Duke uh, Quinchon University, for example, these are areas we're working on, and not just between the two schools, but between one school located in the US and connected there, and one school located here in China and connected. And the three areas will not surprise you, I think. Sustainability, health, and education itself. Those are the three areas that are relatively less controversial, right? I mean, anything can be controversial, but those are things that we all have between the two nations and globally a shared interest in. There are, and that we need to have universities having that kind of openness and dialogue on. Just this week, I'm here with a, a delegation with 10 leaders from Duke who are here in Beijing, Shanghai, Kunshan, focused on building that bridge, working on sustainability kinds of issues. And I think in those three areas and the education being this conversation about what are the innovations in the US? What are innovations in China? What's happening in the world? How can we further build collaborations and experiment? At DKU, we have much to learn about what's happening across China. When I started to come here 10 years ago, and I was helping to build a new curriculum 
for uh, Duke Kun Chan University, I came to Tsinghua, I came to PKU, I came to Fudan, I came to understand what was being here, what was already creative and interesting, and what fit here. And I was really struck by, I worried that my Chinese colleagues would see us as competition, would see, oh, we're setting up this Sino-American joint venture, and uh, it's, it's going to be competitive. And it was the opposite. They welcomed us, and they said, yes, you should try things that you fit what you're trying to do, and we can learn from that, and you can learn from us. And that's the difference between being a visitor, right? When you, when you come, and you come here for a week, and you say hello, and we have exchanges, and then you go home, and actually having a campus here, like NYU Shanghai, like DKU, where we are actually trying to be embedded and having, and, and thinking as Professor Ponce said, thinking about the next hundred years in education, not about the current controversies. Uh, and those are three areas, I think. Innovations in education, talent training, which connects, as Professor Penn just suggested, to sustainable development, which also connects to the health of our nations and all of us as individuals. So those seem to me three areas we can really make, co make progress on in that steady, slow ways that universities are actually very good at doing. Yeah. Uh, time is limited, and uh, we are still open for the last question. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you, professors. This is very um, fascinating and uh, inspiring and makes it all hopeful. And I have one question. We're talking about all those new university and global universities. And I want to ask a question like, um, do you think history is an important subject uh, today? And how should these uh, global universities teach histories today and to help um, well, the new generations from the worldwide to understand what we are and where we're from now? Do you think it's important? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a question for both of you. I, I will start and uh, look forward to Professor Pond's uh, wisdom. Um, it's essential. Without it, we should just quit. When we built DKU, it was very important that we build uh, the natural and applied sciences, the social sciences, and the arts and humanities, and uh, especially history, because of all the reasons you know. This is not the first time we've had global universities. This is not the first time we've encountered these kinds of challenges. And I think both as an individual, as an individual student and as a country, I want to come back to that notion of being rooted, right? That you need to know your own history. You need to know your country's own history. But that's not enough. You also need to know other countries and other countries' histories. And you need to be comfortable in learning back and forth. Jeff Lehman, the uh, vice chancellor at uh, NYU Shanghai, was here not long ago. And he made a very powerful point that when students at places like DKU and NYU Shanghai get together at first, they have all these stereotypes of each other, right? Chinese, American, European, and they're very sort of fragile, and they're stuck in their patriotism, right? And over time, it's not that they give up on caring about their country, but they learn their own history alongside um, learning about others' histories, and they can be more flexible and open about what is strong and proud of what they, themselves and their country, and what's strong and proud about other countries, and how to, it doesn't mean the conflicts go away, but it means they have a context. So the first course at DKU that all students take is called China in the World, because we want, we want all the international students to understand there's a long history of China's engagement in the world. And we want Chinese students 
who may not have encountered that in high school in the same way. And we want them to learn together. Then in their second year, they study uh, 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 global challenges. And then in their third year, they study ethics and citizenship, what it means to them. And so the idea here is to keep iterating and coming back to these questions about who are you as a person? What are you trying to do in your identity? And also, where are your country's roots, but what are the global connections as well? And that all of us live in a world where we navigate between the individual, the national, and the global. We go up and down that scale. That's what's new in human history, that so many people are doing that. And the only way to think about that is historically. Yeah, I fully agree with the professor Picas. This is essential. Is essential. You know, 43 years ago, excellent question. 43 years ago, you know, I got into the national exam. National exam, exam, Gokou. You know, I my first interest is to go to Beida, the, the Department of History. But my, my teacher talked to me, high school teacher talked to me, please, please don't go there. Why? Because uh, in Chinese. So it's a wrong decision. You know, there's a still a few regrets. So there's, then I pick up the mathematics and the useless for the future. So, and, but his, history is uh, useful. You can see a lot of today's uh, leaders, current leaders, business leaders, a lot of uh, financial institutions, the leaders, Goldman, and uh, JP Morgan, big ones. You can, you can name it. You can find out what's their major. A lot, a lot of them is from history. And uh, you can see the, 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 uh, the political leaders. The number one, the founding father of, of the People's Republic of China, Chairman Mao. You know, he's a great, great grand the historian, right? So the old books, Zhizhi Tongjian, they read it 16 times, right? So there's a big one. So why this? A lot of business leaders, I mean, the all the leaders, you can name it. Why this? Because history is a mirror, is a flexion for today and for, the, for tomorrow. So if you know the history, you know today is better. And you know the future is better. And uh, history gives you very big, broad vision, broad vision. So I have a class, teaching class in the Tsinghua, I have four classes I was teaching there. The one is we call the business history. So if you, want, you are interested in that, you can go there but you have to pay it. So, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, how time flies is uh, 3.30 p.m. Beijing time and uh, CCG Global Dialogue event this time in dialogue with Professor Nova Picas and Professor Pan Chen Zhong will come to a close. And uh, thank you our two distinguished guests for your wonderful speech great conversation and so many good answers to so many questions. And uh, also thank you our dear friends and audience both on the spot and online. Thank you all. And uh, how about we take a group photo together with two professors? <laughs>